Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Zoe Strimple. Zoe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brendan. Great to be here. Uh, There's loads of stuff I want to talk to you about, stuff you've been writing about in your column in the Sunday Telegraph and in other publications as well. But I want to kick off by asking you about lockdown and the impact of lockdown on our lives. Lots of people are now talking about the consequences of having shut down society for a year or two in relation to the economy, in relation to people's sense of mental health, all sorts of things that we're worried that this might have had a larger impact than we previously thought. And one of the things you're best known as is a historian of intimacy, a historian of gender. You write extensively, including in your books, about the relations between the sexes and how they change and what's going on with all of that. And I wanted to kick off by asking you what impact you think lockdown might have had on intimacy and on people's ability or willingness to strike up relationships. Do you think that kind of black hole of no socialising is going to have a long term consequence for relations between people? Well, I should probably start by saying, and I know that you'll um, you'll you'll relish this because you're a, a king or, or slash champion of, of genuine ideological diversity. So I I didn't see lockdown as as you know as terrible as many of my sort of stable mates do. So the first thing is to say I think it was understandable given the circs. In terms, and and I'm you know I think there were upsides to it as well. It was always going to have long term impacts, but the short term seemed to me to be more. Um, urgent. In terms of, you know, what it did to people, you know, I think the the area where we're seeing lockdown has maybe had um, the most noticeable effects, uh, fundamental effects, I guess, um, and perhaps like truly changed the way we are in the world is more around things to do with work and mm. um, reluctance to physically go places, I suppose. Um And um, a kind of expectation because of the generous furlough scheme that you can sort of both not do much, um, not physically go too far, but also not necessarily strive to, you know, do much or improve your situation because, you know, the nanny state is actually in in full blown uh, glory. At, uh, well, COVID showed us that that we can look to the state um, for for everything. Basically, uh, the state actually anticipates what we might want. I mean, when we're getting letters from the government saying, or from our energy companies, I should say, saying, "Don't worry, you don't have to pay as much as you would normally pay," and you think, "Well, you know." That's that should be means tested. That that's there's something very weird about the money tree vibes in terms of the way like relationships were impacted. You know, I actually think it's kind of the opposite of what people are inclined to think. I was one of many who was absolutely terrified at the start that that was the end of sexuality. Like I would, I couldn't even imagine going on a date with someone because <laughs> how would you ever want someone to breathe on you ever again? But I think it was actually a relatively short period when people were shut up away from each other. And I think, interestingly, I think that came back with a vengeance, the sort of um, mojo for meeting up and dating. I think maybe where people did change a bit, and again, it's not unique to dating, is in this kind of reluctance to basically leave the house and uh, tear yourself away from your whatever it is you're streaming and the Deliveroo. Uh, and it's just so easy. You know, we, we created these castles out of our homes mm-hmm. and um, we became sort of, um, yeah, not like, yeah, I suppose uncomfortable, not agoraphobic, but like not entirely dissimilar to that. So I think, you know, that inevitably has had some knock on effects on people's ability to actually just stay like to kind of keep the, even if they do go out, their their minds wander back mm. to how they could be at home and having yeah. a delivery. So that may have affected it. But yeah, that that's a that's a long rambly answer to your question, Brendan. No, that that's a good answer. And and one thing that I've been thinking about is the possibility that some people have internalized the lockdown. So even though we're not still legally locked down, there is no law telling us to stay at home. People have internalized aspects of the lockdown. I think you're right. Some people enjoyed the lockdown. Other people obviously hated it. I think one thing that I've always found interesting is the class differential. So you have the pyjama classes on one hand or the laptop classes as as 
I guess people like us can be referred to because we can work from home. We're lucky enough to be able to do that. And then you have other sections of society who absolutely cannot work from home, who have to be in a physical place doing physical, useful things for society. And I think it was probably much more difficult for those people who were no longer productive at all. But in terms of what you've just said there, people, even when people are out, they're not really out. There is this kind of sense Uh, should I be at home? Should I be taking part in that experiment of comfort that we all had for a period of time in 2020? And I wanted to ask you in relation to that, whether you think that kind of feeling in society today is not just a product of lockdown, but of certain trends that preceded lockdown, certain trends towards, I don't know, atomization or not being particularly sociable, People wanting to live in a safe space, wanting to live in a bit of a bubble, not willing to take risks. Even sex has become safe. Safe sex is what you're all supposed to have these days. Everything becomes quite distant and hygienic. Do you think the lockdown exacerbated trends that already existed in society? Yeah, and I think as a historian, one is sort of um, gets in the habit of of usually steering clear of explaining things through single ruptures or Mm. events and thinking more long-term things. I think what you pick up on is really interesting. I think that this question, this idea of safe is very interesting because it crosses different uh, domains. It it means physically safe, obviously with, with, um, COVID, uh, there were, there were concerns for actual physical safety, which I think made sense. Um, and, um, you know, for various reasons, but this idea of the, most important value that we have in society is uh, being about safety of a psychological type, of a sexual type, of, you know, constantly, you know, being on the lookout for microaggressions or, you know, whatever the equivalent of a microaggression is in all different at- fields of life definitely was was happening beforehand. But, uh, you know, and actually that's, that's a point. I think Me Too uh, was one of the first moments when we started having this like real proliferation of vocabulary, like vocabulary about feeling safe or not safe or, or being safe or not safe. And, you know, Me Too began because, because there were real questions of, of safety and, and a lot of men who ended up behind bars really had behaved uh, violently and coercively, but there was still a massive, massive gray area. And it was also a discursive area, you know, took place at the level of language, mostly in Twitter and social media that was like not clearly about actual physical safety. And we've pivoted through like all the critical race theory stuff, all the Black Lives Matter stuff since then into this full blown parallel universe where, you know, students say they're unsafe. This is a cliche, but unfortunately, as I have recently Mm -hmm. been forced to realize it's true, um, people actually mistake. And that's why when the Ukraine war started, I mean, I was like, all right, this is this is a really important moment for people to understand what actual danger is, like bombs falling on you or like you're going to get killed. That's that's actual danger. Like the idea that, you know, all the very many things. So, so yeah, I think I think the sort of general sense that are that that um, a psychological safety, which doesn't even what does that mean? You can never pinpoint it. And so I think if, if our problems had just been people becoming all hypochondriacs, well, I'm a hypochondriac, so I'm much more sympathetic to that. <laughs> You know, I worry about illness and so on. But yeah, the, the other thing I think is actually more to do with late capitalism. So let, less to do with uh, the psycho- the sort of political, cultural, political condition of safety and more to do with the idea that, you know, one of the glories, I mean, I'm a capital, I'm very into the, into capitalism and choice and late capitalism. And one of the great things about it is that it kind of, conf- it makes it seem like you know, the fact that we can get our food delivered to our doorstep and all these things that are seamless, that aren't actually seamless, they're really complex, but life increasingly takes on the the feeling of being easy, even though somebody has to pay. But I think, you know, the economy is very confusing. It's very, very complex. The, the 2008 crisis showed us just how comp- so complicated, even bankers don't know what they're doing, what it means. So I think most people don't understand the economic forces that are shaping their lives. They do understand that capitalism has evolved to the point that they have the most incredibly easy options if they want to take them. The question we have to deal with as a society is what is generating money now? Like what are the things that are actually creating things? You know, there was a tweet from Isabel Oakshot today, I think, saying like she's in central London today. It was deserted. A nation cannot survive on people sitting at home on their ass, um, waiting for government handouts and ordering food by Deliveroo. And I think there there's something in that. Yeah, absolutely. There definitely is. And 
I think in relation to the safety question, I find that really interesting because it's quite strange because on the one hand, everyone wants to be safe and society should be able to keep people safe. But as you say, when it gets turned into the highest ideal of living, it becomes a very odd phenomenon where you go through life thinking, I must be safe all the time, not just from violence, everyone should be safe from violence, but from words, from ideas. And one thing that's always struck me is that even pre-COVID, um, you know, the metaphor of disease had become incredibly popular in, in public discussion. You know, relationships are toxic. Masculinity is toxic. There are books about toxic parents. Uh, you know, ideas are viral. Content is viral. Uh, and then you have the words contagion, uh, emotional contagion, financial contagion, mental contagion. The, the language of disease has actually been influenced in how we think about society and ourselves for quite some time. And I think COVID kind of might have propelled that forward because that was a real physical disease which seemed to add some weight to this idea that the world is a scary place and other people are a bit of a danger to to us well just to come in on that briefly i think in a way you know i'm finding it totally fascinating psychological health is being overdiagnosed mm. i think to, in a really interesting way right now i'm i'm you know hopefully about to write something about this but every day a new friend who's my age, 40 or late 30s, whatever, says they've been diagnosed with ADHD. Yeah. And so there's this idea that we are all, it's instead of being man is born free and is everywhere in chains, man is born ill and is everywhere undiagnosed. Like that's how it feels. So it's like it, this, this, yeah. So it's like we are, we come into the world very weak. Like we are fragile. We are ill. We, we live to be diagnosed. We live for a pathologization. And that's not to minimize real mental illness and, and or just min mental illness full stop. But it just has really struck me how, you know, this, this idea of like, we're not only not safe in a world where there's a sort of, you know, climate Armageddon or that people fear or, or the people fear the gap between rich and poor, they fear, fear racial injustice. But they've also, in addition to that, we're laboring under these like mental illnesses or not disorders, anxiety disorders. And the thing about those, and I do think they, the left is a little quicker to mobilize those particular diagnoses. And again, I would never say they definitely don't have them or whatever, but it shuts down whatever is happening. So if somebody says, yeah, but I, I have this, like you, you can't get, you know, you, you're triggering my, and then fill in the blank. You can't really go anywhere from there. So I do think we've we've gotten quite a bit weaker in some ways. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I think the, the idea of mental contagion or the idea of mental safety, mental comfort, I think is really problematic. And it, when you say, you know, you, you don't want to under, undermine serious mental health conditions. I think that's absolutely right. I would say that some of this fashion for describing oneself as mentally ill actually has the effect of undermining serious conditions because it, it often can deprive them of resources or distract attention from people who have genuine mental health problems and focus it all on you know, this new trend on TikTok, for example, for self-diagnosing yourself as bipolar or whatever else people might want to say. And that, so I, I found that interesting. But on, on, on the idea of mental comfort and mental safety, I did want to talk to you about an experience you had recently at a university where the students thought that you would threaten their safety and presumably their their mental well-being. I had a similar experience when I was prevented from speaking at Oxford in, in 2014. And 
me and Timothy Stanley, who writes of the Telegraph, we were prevented from speaking. And the argument made by the students who no platformed us is that we they would feel unsafe while we were on campus. And it was such a bizarre thing, firstly, because none of those would have come to the discussion. They would have just been in their rooms doing their usual thing. But there was this idea that unsafety was almost like a free-floating disease that could infect them and and destabilise them. And you had a similar experience, didn't you, where students basically yeah. said that you were not a safe presence for them to deal with. Well, right. And the, the interesting thing was that, um, after I'd, uh, it was, it was, a, it was after, it was after the fact. So the, it had been a good session and, um, and I had really, uh, gone out of my way to make everyone feel very not embarrassed about the fact that most of them didn't seem to know very much or, um, you know, it was, it was, it was a friendly, positive thing. I worked hard. They were polite. It was nice. Then, it was after the fact they Googled me and then they thought retrospectively, this person has threatened our ability to, to learn because we are diverse and she's, you know, her very, I mean, that it really sharp, like elucidated or crystallized the madness of the situation because it wasn't even like they knew anything about me beforehand and, or, or more to the point, it wasn't like I'd been in the class and been horrible to them or let, made them all cry which by the way, used to happen in my day, very regular and your day too, probably very regular. Like people always be, being made to cry. It was not very nice, but like you didn't. So, so it was just this sort of post, you know, post facto or whatever the saying is application of this concept. And it was very rigid and it was very dreary and it was very bullying because it was clear that anyone who'd wanted to disagree, um, would not have been able to, because it was a sort of sense that like, we, the people have decided that because this person writes for the telegraph and what have you, um, you know, she, she's been a harmful presence. So it, it really was. And, you know, the thing is I was beginning to think, well, I don't think this is, um, such a, maybe this isn't such a bad thing after all, you know, the, maybe the campus stuff isn't so bad. Maybe I have been slightly radicalized by being a telegraph columnist. <laughs> and then it was like, wow, you know, the, this is, this is literally any, this is the, it's like the pattern or the, it's like you could, you could have just plucked it out of any number of different such letters that we've seen. So it's really interesting. It's like a, yeah, like a meme almost, or like, I mean, I would say it's like a virus actually, the kind of way they all follow the same patterns. It's really freaky, but it was, it was, very, but actually, do you know what? I was kind of like, I was kind of like, okay, I see how if you're an academic, you know, you might very well give in to this because it's scary. But on the other hand, I thought, God, why have, why are people giving in to these yeah. people? Why not just like take them for what it's, you know, sit down with them and it wouldn't be that hard, I don't think, to kind of just stand up to them. Yeah. Um so I offered to sort of sit down with them and stuff, but it was the end, you know, we'll we'll see. But yeah, it's 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 a very I really and I think the ability of undergraduates now to learn and for anyone to learn has been the irony of course is that they have threatened it hugely and teachers have been complicit in this by allowing this crap this 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 actually really mean spiteful crap often based on just complete ignorance of the actual whatever it is they're studying i mean how are you supposed to sp speak freely i mean I, I i don't know like i don't think students even ask questions anymore cuz they don't feel like they can or they don't even know that life isn't about being spoon fed. I mean, I don't want to be like your typical old person mm. being like, oh, the young, you know, back in my day. But it, it's sobering. It really is. And I don't know how they're going to, you know, especially decolonizing the curriculum is such a terrible thing, you know, such an awful regime, even though on the face of it, like all this stuff, they try to make it. So, oh, well, what's wrong with that? Like, why wouldn't you want like more voices to be heard? Yeah, more voices. Great. Add more voices. But at the end, you're going to come up against the fact that you're in a Western yeah. society and the world has, you know, these, these are the sources and these, these, you know, this is the stuff that's risen to the top. So I, I don't know how, you know, what the next generation is even, I don't even know what these guys are going to think is real. I mean, it's scary, don't you think? Yeah, it absolutely is scary. And on, on the decolonized stuff, the one story that made me laugh last year or the year before, um, students at Edinburgh University were decolonizing their curriculum and they wanted to get some of the white authors off the literature course and get some black authors on, including W.E.B. Du Bois, the great American late 19th, early 20th century writer. I'm massively in favor of people reading more Du Bois. But the irony there, of course, is that some of his greatest writing was about the right of people like him, 
African Americans to read Shakespeare and to read Chaucer and to engage with the greatest literature and the greatest art. And he was always furious at the idea in late 19th century America that um, black people were only fit for a certain kind of education and they couldn't be exposed to the wonders of culture because they wouldn't relate to it. And that's now being rehabilitated. That racist idea is being rehabilitated in some of the decolonized ideology. There's a really uh, twisted irony to that. But I wanted to ask you uh, what you think is causing some of this stuff, because I'm always slightly torn on the student stuff on campus. I've been writing about it for quite a long time. I think there is definitely a culture of intolerance. And I find myself torn between, on the one hand, thinking it's just very ideological. These are upper middle class kids often. Uh, this kind of censorship is definitely worse at the um, top universities than at the red brick ones or at the former polys. So there's something interesting in that. But also another part of me thinks that they genuinely do feel hurt by words. They genuinely do feel triggered. Almost, I, I've seen students be physically triggered and on some occasion have to be helped from a room uh, because they heard something. In this case, it was because I said something one of them really didn't like. Um, so how real is it? Do you think because they've been brought up in a particular let's not sound like old people, but it, because they've been brought up in a particular way, their self-esteem has been massaged in a particular way, they've been educated or socialized to think that they are vulnerable and the world is cruel, that they genuinely do feel words and people like you as a threat? Or is that a pose because they want to have ideological dominance and they don't want your ideas to enjoy free reign? What, how would you balance yeah. that out? That's interesting. I mean, I wouldn't, I'd have to go into kind of the realms of pure speculation to imagine a certain kind of um, parenting style maybe that they mm. had, which would be very different from my parenting style and probably your parenting, the parenting style you had as a child, um, which is probably kind of like, you know, at all costs, little Bella must not be allowed to, fe you know, to, to, to be crossed in any way. Like she must, you know, God forbid any bad, you know, but, and so you know, it's, I think the big change is that schools are now obsessed with preventing children from experiencing any anything that might hurt them. And, and I found school a deeply bruising and painful place because people were absolutely assholes. Like I was bullied. I fought back. I mean, it was brutal. And I, do, mm. I don't particularly wish that on people. But I think it did, it does kind of allow you to go into life kind of with the idea that priced into life is that you're going to feel sh upset sometimes and people are going to be assholes and you're going to feel really offended. And you might even cry, but that that's just literally the rough and that is literally part of life. That's not something to specifically identify as a form of trauma or attack or something like that. So I might, I think it's partly to do with changes in parenting, partly to do with changes in schools. However, I do think that what really is going on here is just a grab for power. Mm -hmm. And again, that's like what children do. If they're raised in a certain way and they learn from their parents, you give them a certain form of manipulation and they get power from it. That's the kids can be really manipulative and it's just something they've learned, you know, and that's what's going on here. So everybody, all the adults in the, have said to them, here, if you claim to be a victim, you will have loads of power because you can shut down all these other people who, you know, and this, so why wouldn't you? You'd have to be a really special person who used a huge amount of willpower to go against that. And that is why I think it's not just white middle-class kids, unfortunately. And it, this goes back to the uh, Dubois point and also to some degree, you know, which was picked up in John McWhorter's excellent book, Woke Racism. But, um, you know, unfortunately, minority kids are being told from every angle that they should be angry. And I think it really gets in the way. And, and the, the group that turned against me it had a lot of um, black kids in it, basically. And I was like, cool, like maybe, you know, diversity is working and great. And then maybe it, it all is great and so on and so forth. But the fact is, unfortunately, I think their learning experience in life is going to be derailed in this country because they've obviously been told, indoctrinated, that they are victims, even yeah. though they were at a brilliant university, like they seem pretty well to do. Like so, so I think if you hand people that kind of a stick to beat everyone else with and to give yourself power, yeah, it's not that surprising they're going to take it. You know, you, you'd have to be a pretty. You know, obviously there are plenty of really amazing people of color, ethnic minorities in this country um, who who resist that, but but I think it's hard. Because, you know, everyone is telling you, take it, take it. You're a victim. You're, you know, you're a minority. You know, the, you know, don't even get me started on the, this is slightly separate, the welcome collection business. Um, you know, now it's like the new frontier ableism and all that. I mean, it's just, it's endless. It, it is endless. And I think that point about 
um, the weaponization of victimhood is is really important. And I, I think that's probably their, their strongest weapon in their armor. Because as you say, if people are brought up to think that they are victims, but also that being a victim gives you a special insight and a special form of authority, then they'd be a fool not to try and wield that to their own benefit. And I think that is happening in younger generations and probably in older generations too. And in relation to that, I wanted to ask you about one of the issues on which that is, I think, most apparent, um, and I've experienced this on campuses and off campuses as well, is in relation to the trans issue, um, which is a very interesting issue. I think 2022 may have may have been a bit of a turning point in relation to the trans discussion. Uh, there were the troubles with the Tavistock Clinic, which is uh, closing down. Uh, many more women, including you, have raised your voices to say, look, um, trans rights, that's fine, but um, men aren't women and, and that's life. And I think that Britain is now being referred to as Turf Island, which I think is something, a, a label we should wear as a, with pride because lots of people are speaking out on this and things do seem to be changing. But then at the same time, we've got Nicola Sturgeon pushing through a gender bill, which I think is borderline psychotic and, and quite destabilizing. So how do you see that issue panning out? Are you optimistic or, or, or really what are your concerns in relation to the trans question? Well, my concerns are probably twofold. One, as speaking as a woman who very much enjoys female only spaces that involve being naked, like the ladies pond on Hampstead Heath, mm. where one changes and has showers and things like that. Um, presumably if I were a prisoner or in hospital, God, like, thank God, neither of those is applicable, um, or gym changing rooms or anything. I, I would, um, I do, I, I speaking as one of those women, I would absolutely hate to see a penis in there. I would hate it. And every, and most women would as well, I think. And it's not because we don't like men. It's not because we don't like penises. It's because it's, I don't know. It's maybe it's just a difference between men. Men would probably be happy if it, I, I don't know. It, there's something about it which is sacred, and therefore I think, you know, I personally take the view that if if somebody if a if a man wants to become a woman and he gets the genitals taken off and there's no it, it has goes to that extent, I personally am okay with that. Um, it's it's that's nothing to do with the epistemological or ontological questions of whether they've become a woman or not. It's just like if you want to be in women only spaces, you kind of have to go, get the whole thing done. In fact, the bottom more important than the top, just for obvious reasons. So I think I think obviously underpinning that point of view is on one hand a kind of visceral response that many women would share to do with like sexual danger and just comfort. And it's also really nice to just have your own space as men probably know too. But um, the other thing is this question of is right, wrong, top, down, up, you know, left, right. Like there's a sort of been this massive confusion of, of what is, you know, things have been top really turned. And I think the reason people have gone so nuts over the trans stuff is because it, it seeks to overthrow an entire you know, epistemological regime to use a very mm. like pretentious sounding term, but like an entire way of looking at the world is like, that is the case or that is not the case. And, you know, I think, I think things are complicated and I think there is no, it, a lot of things aren't black and white, but I think people feel that some of this stuff really should be, you know, you can say people have gender dysphoria. You can say people are, you know, trans women or dressing in a certain way or need to feel another identity, but that is different from saying they literally are the woman or whatever. Number two, and that that's really concerning to people, I think, and really unsettling that a lot of people seem to be just like asserting, it's like saying there's a unicorn at the end of the garden. Like, no, like, but, but no, I mean, just you can, anyway. <laughs> but uh, the thing that I think is the big thing really in the trans stuff that often gets hidden in the discourse for some reason, which I don't really know, is the the, the psychological plague that is leading to so many girl, teenage girls trying to become boys well, at least to the level of binding their breasts or having double mastectomies and taking hormones. And I think that's so sad because I, I don't get it. When I was growing up, like we all got the impression that boys were losers and like, <laughs> you know, it was much better to be a girl because you, A, you were smarter, B, you were, you knew what was what. See, like, it, you know, there was, there was just nothing that is even remotely familiar to me from my girlhood or teenagehood about what's going on now. Eventually I went to a school where there was like one girl that had anorexia. And, and I know that in some schools that's more, but it seems to me that, that like this is a mass, like it's like the equivalent of 
anorexia. It's like the equivalent of teeny bopper, but way worse, or even his, you know, what used to be called hysteria. Some like it's a seriously troubling trend. And I don't, and I, it's very ironic that we live in this time of like where everyone's bent over backwards to make girls feel empowered and equality of the sexes and everything. And then even in that context, they end up want, you know, wanting to be couples, but it's literally never been a better time to be a girl. Like you are welcomed in circles. Like I've taken up chess recently. Like I can't, the men are so lovely. They're so happy that I'm there because like, it's so <laughs> rare. It's like, it's it just, I just, it's so sad to see that. But I think that is like the big, and, but people have been drawing attention to that to those numbers, which are just yeah. so crazy of these teenage girls. And it's, it's so obviously something that isn't to do with gender dysphoria because it's just, it's late onset. It comes from other people in the friend group. It's a lot of the girls that do it have been had to have autism or whatever it is. And mm. you, a lot of them are just gay. It, the whole thing is such a horrible mess. And I wrote about this years ago that these are grown up ideas that are really, really fringe and extreme and really dark in some ways. And they have been normalized yeah. to the point that young people are looking for them. And then obviously social media makes it easier, but oh, it's messed up. I mean, if I'd been a kid, probably me and half my friends would be mm. told we were trans at this point. Seriously. That's the key thing. It's, it's, this is obviously something dark and problematic and deserving of um, some serious study and someone putting up a stop sign to all of this. But instead of that being recognised, it gets turned into, as you say, something to aspire to, something that's celebrated on the front pages of magazines all over Instagram. Uh, everyone's declaring their pronouns. It's become the, the fashionable thing to be involved in. And it's like, you know, where are the adults? Where are the adults in the room to come in and say, listen, if you're a 14 year old girl and your body changes, that's absolutely fine. Don't bind your breasts. Don't do anything like that. That Those adults seems to, seem to have disappeared. And uh, I wanted to ask you about the role of misogyny in this. Now, misogyny is obviously a strong word, of course. It seems pretty clear to me that uh, the treatment of some of the women who criticize the excesses of transgenderism is definitely misogynistic. You know, you only yeah. need to look at what people say to JK Rowling to, to see that. Yeah. It's, a, it's very sexist language that they use. Yeah, yeah. But also, it's very interesting. You mentioned Me Too earlier, and I'm quite interested in the shift from Me Too to what we're living through now. So the one example was, do you remember the We Spa controversy in Los Angeles where a man who claims to be a woman was in the women's changing room with a semi erect penis, which he exposed to women and to a child. And what was really interesting about that is the guardian devoted a huge amount of resources to disproving this and to calling into question the claims of the woman who brought it to light. And they said, well, we can't trust this woman. She's a fundamentalist Christian. She's, she might be lying. It turns out she wasn't lying. Uh, so it seemed to undercut the whole idea of Me Too, which was believe women, keep men at bay in certain situations. Is all of that, is there a danger that part of the problem with the trans issue is that it actually does ride roughshod over women's rights or certainly over some of the gains that women have made in recent decades in terms of their own spaces, their own safety, their own right to live as they please? I mean, Julie Bindel, obviously, um, is very funny on this because she's so blunt about like the yeah. women that support the trans movement. What does she call them? Like cock pleasers or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's, there's a sort of another kind of slightly pretentious, but I think potentially interesting way of looking at this his, in terms of long sweeps of history or dynamics of history, which is this idea of patriarchal equilibrium, which is like the best example of that that I've read about is to do with medieval women Brewsters who in the year 1300 basically started taking, you know, brewing was done at home. They were brilliant. And by 1500, they'd made the English brewing industry so fantastic that men shut them out and they weren't allowed to do it anymore. And forevermore, they were, you know, until for hundreds of years barred from it. So, you know, in a way, there's, I think the same thing sometimes happens with like feminist gains. And there's that, you know, famous Susan Faludi book, which is really excellent called Backlash. And it's about after, you know, in the nineties, after these, these two decades where women appear to be making progress, there's this need to kind of put them back in their box. And there are these dynamics that sort of happen and women can be complicit in this. So, you know, to me, it seems striking that Me Too was a moment of when women were, it was all about the realities of biological womanhood. And it was very much about the sexes being different and men's behavior towards women, um, and absolutely believe the woman, um, and women generally speaking, I don't think do lie about this stuff because it's, it's a hell of a lot of hassle if you're going to do it. 
Um, and also, you know, you just don't want to, but, um, there does seem to now be this, 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 there was this moment when everyone thought, oh my God, finally, like it was actually a movement me too, where even some like working class women occasionally ultimately managed to get a squeak in, although it was mostly middle class and them. But there, there did, you did sort of get the feeling that in the cultures, at least workplace cultures, not the kind of horrible man on the street leering at you, but you know, things did seem to change. And it was very much like, it, it was legible to everyone. Everyone understood what was meant by women are sexually molested, assaulted, it's harassed by men regularly in all environments. Um, that made sense. People knew what that meant. What is weird, and this is exactly what you're picking up on, is that very quickly after that, there started to be a new um, movement where women were the enemy simply for saying they were biological women. Uh, the very things that had given them credence had suddenly become like, shut up. If you don't accept penises in your midst, semi-erect or otherwise, like you're a you know, bigot or a, you know, you're a transphobe and you're all these terrible things. And it was just so weird because the number of you know, times when this is going to happen is very small. Number of people in the population it affects is still relatively small, but obviously growing. So it seemed to be about something else. And that something else seems to be perhaps a misogynistic backlash, which is a deep dynamic that we see coming through history all the time. So I, I I, I'm inclined to look at it like that. I think also that, you know, ideas just like percolate at their own speed and the trans stuff. I mean, when I did, I actually did a gender studies MPhil at Cambridge uh, about in 2012, 13. And we, you know, trans stuff was very minorly mentioned, but there was a lot of theory about, you know, about women, you know, it was that people were actually more interested in like the idea of the cyborg manifesto, Donna Harrow's idea that, that like robots or medical science would extend the body in various ways. And people were interested in that, but it was very academic. Mm -hmm. But then these, these post these sort of ideas from the campus did end up sort of weirdly infiltrating everything. And it came together with all the black critical race theory, Black Lives Matter really galvanized it. And they all sort of, the, the dynamic, the, the, the way they all came out together, I think is significant. And so it's like a runaway set of bad ideas that all relate to each other uh, and have very little, little to do with what they say they're about. Uh, okay. So that nicely brings me on to something else I wanted to talk to you about that the idea of campus thinking crashing into real life. You mentioned Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about identity politics. And I want to kick off by asking you about, I think one of the issues you write best on, and I've really admired your stuff on this, is anti-Semitism and the scourge of anti-Semitism that exists in sections of the British left and in British society. One thing I've noticed, just to kick this bit off, one thing I've noticed is that Jewish women who write about this stuff or speak about this stuff get the most amount of flack, I think, of any section of public life. Uh, gender critical feminists get a lot as well. But if you look at Rachel Riley, uh, Luciana Berger, other people, um, you know, they're hounded out of political parties. They are demeaned constantly online in a way that no other person from a minority group would be if they talked about their experiences of racism or if they talked about their experiences of oppression or their understanding of their experiences. It just wouldn't happen. A few right-wing racist cranks might tell a Muslim woman to shut the hell up. Uh, but there wouldn't be that kind of extraordinary backlash that always happens. And I know you've experienced it too. What do you think is driving the resurgence of that kind of anti-Semitism in so-called progressive circles? What's really going on here, do you think? So, I mean, just to say on the, on the woman and the Jewish thing, I mean, woman is just like across all minorities or just types of people, women always infuriate people more. Jews, the anti-Semitism thing is absolutely the nub of this rather than the, the Jewish women things. I mean, that was the combination is totally toxic. And so anti-Semitism was a completely central part of the far left in the 1970s and 80s. No, less the 70s. Basically, after the Lebanon War 1982, I think, with Israel. But that was when the left started to become very, very anti-Israel. And through that, you know, that became their conduit for expressing things that, you know, very quickly just became out and out anti-Semitism that any idiot could see was anti-Semitism. And this was the culture from which Jeremy Corbyn emerged in Islington. And I know this, I mean, I, I used to do a 
postdoc on um, Spare Rib magazine, which was a feminist magazine, the women's liberation movement's national magazine, actually, which was began commercially and was really good, actually, in the 70s and was actually quite interesting in the 80s. But at that point, as it went on, it became obsessed with race. So basically everything that happened in the 80s and 90s is what's happening now. Race, anti-racism is very often anti-Semitic. Yeah. Anti-racism is all about pitching the Jew as the white privileged enemy. And anti-racism will shift in whatever ways it needs to in order to ostracize and mock and ultimately, to quote my good friend David Deutsch, legitimize the harming of Jews. Um, so what happened in the 70s? Yeah, I mean, they, they got more and more interested. And then they, the, the, the people that ran Spare Rib magazine it's, it, as a collective, it was run largely by Jewish women. They ended up basically replacing all those Jewish women who were white. You know, they the women themselves said that well, they you know were dealing with so much anti-Semitism here, but with black women because that was deemed you know black women were very angry and they needed their voice. And fair enough, there was a lot of racism at the time. But what, unfortunately, the the dyna- this basically ended up giving the green light to like egregious um, uh, policies. Like Jewish women were not only Jewish women were not permitted to write in or advertise in Spare Rib magazine unless they first submitted a statement, not only disavowing their support for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, but also their their belief that Israel itself was basically a criminal state and shouldn't exist. So this this was actually even picked up by the national news as a, as a kind of openly anti-Semitic policy. So this is the environment. This was the loony left. It was obsessed with Israel. It was obsessed with Jews being they would call, regularly call them basically Nazis, you know, use every, this is like 30 years after the, the camps, right? And they're using this kind of language. Um, and then it's what's really weird. What, what ended up happening was that Jeremy freaking Corbyn nearly became prime minister. And so the, we had this, we had this march, maybe via Ken Livingston, but the slow respectability of the loony left. And they brought their crappy ideas with them. And, and then it, it all kind of came together with the, you know, got the extra imprimatur of the universities because a lot of the, I suppose, postmodern ideas, but various other things came together with some of that, these liberation movements um, of the 1960s and 70s. And it all just sort of, I don't know, eventually, but the weird thing is that it just, it didn't seem to be that big of a normal thing until, yeah, the Corbyn. I think a lot of people just thought, oh, Corbyn will be good on on the other stuff. And actually, who cares about whether he's a bit anti-Semitic from the far left? There's almost a fondness for left-wing anti-Semitism in this country. It makes, it's sort of familiar. And also people get very bored and impatient and they roll their eyes when Jews, you know, cry anti-Semitism, no matter how true it is. As you say, it's the only people where that is actually acceptable to do. Oh, come on, it's not anti-Semitism. The amount of times people who are even like close to me said that like the Corbyn thing was all made up. It was just a smear campaign. I mean, relentless. So so it really, it showed a disgusting undercurrent um, in, in society, which turned out not to be such an undercurrent after all. And, you know, the, the but the Israel stuff is the, the Guardian is, you know, ever since I was 21, I've been like having heart attacks over, of rage over the coverage of Israel in, in newspapers. And it, it's it's all just part of the same, it's, yeah. Have you signed up to Spiked's daily newsletter yet? It's called Today on Spiked. Every day you'll get a roundup of all our content, plus some exclusive commentary from the Spiked team. So to never miss a thing on Spiked, go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked. I, I couldn't agree with you more about the fact that, and I think this is such a difficult point to explain but one that has to be explained is that anti-semitism today comes in the garb of anti-racism and that is so clear now and it and i think a lot of anti-semites probably do think they're being genuinely anti-racist because and i think i wanted to ask you what how you think that's come about because i think it does reflect the problem with identity politics more broadly, because anti-racism used to be a great, noble cause. If you go back to the 1960s in the US, or even before that, the anti-slavery movement, for a long time, there have been incredibly noble anti-racist movements, which were built on the idea of equality. All people should be treated equally, regardless of what they look like, what color their skin is, and where they come from. Brilliant. I think most people agree with that. 
But in identity politics, what anti-racism has come to mean is that there are privileged people at the top, there are oppressed people at the bottom. We have to organise every social group according to their level of privilege or their level of oppression. And it ends up playing identity groups off one another. So the left will say that Muslims are the most oppressed and therefore you can't criticise Islam, that's Islamophobic. You can't criticise the hijab, that's hijabphobic, which is a real word. Uh, and so they're protected from any kind of social criticism or, or discussion. And then the Jews are at the very top. They're hyper, they're not only white, they're hyper white. They're the most privileged. And therefore, it's open season on Jews. You're allowed to criticise privileged groups. And in fact, you have to. You should be forcing them to check their privilege, to forgive, to, to beg forgiveness for the sins of history. And so they become a targeted group. So do you think the fact that something as repugnant as anti-Semitism can present itself as anti-racism reveals a, a poisonous strain in identity politics and, and the kind of what passes for progressive politics now? I mean, yes, but also I'm going to offer something even more sort of potentially that might sound mad, but you could argue that anti-racist politics and identity politics, such as it now is, exists solely to be anti-Semitic. I mean, that would conform to the logics of anti-Semitism because it doesn't really make sense. You know, that that sounds maybe a bit extreme, but but I've but I am fairly persuaded that like this was when I was reviewing David Badil's book, uh, Jews Don't Count, you know, he wants to be in the intersectionality club. To him, the evidence of anti-Semitism is that intersectional ideas of oppression and various, you know, victimology don't apply to Jews. The re- The reality is that there's a good reason for that. It's not a coincidence. So I think we need to ask not does this hierarchy of oppressions tell us something about the nature of identity politics, but does it maybe actually tell us about how anti-Semitism works? Mm. But also on top of that, I mean, let's let's say that it's a mixture. Yes, I mean, it's it's it really hampers people, I think, having to think through things in this way. I find it very depressing that I think so many American Jews are complicit in this, not only complicit, but helping people entrench these ideas. So there's this whole idea of Ashkenazi privilege, mm. which American Jews are espousing. It's really disappointing. And I think some of this, this um, respectability, this power of left wing, the, the, the way identity politics ends up in um, always casting the Jew as the sort of white privileged one who has, you know, ironically, Jews were really central to the civil rights struggle in the US and against apartheid South Africa. And now the African-American, there's a huge problem with African-American anti-Semitism. So the ironies abound. But instead of Confronting that, American Jews have gone down this weird path of like they've they've disavowed Israel, many of them. They they buy into the idea that they're white and that therefore they deserve, you know, they understand the fact that everyone hates them and stuff like that. And I think we you know, we always import the American viewpoint to some degree. And I, and it's really disturbing. I've really, really lost faith in American Jewry since since this sort of turn has been taken. When I grew up in the nineties, I mean, American Jews were pro-Israel. They were <laughs> like Democrats, but that didn't mean they couldn't, you know, and now it's just like so different. They don't want anything to do with Israel. They buy into Ashkenazi privilege. They don't mind being the victims of egregious, like Black Lives Matter riots that looted Jewish businesses, that mm. deface synagogues and memorials. And this stuff should be the source of huge amounts of like protest. And yeah. It's not happening. So uh, on um, Israel, I want to ask you specifically about Israel. Is it your view that the hatred for Israel, which I think is what it should be referred to as, I think it was Howard Jacobson who said, you know, everyone always says to him, look, it's fine to criticize Israel. And he says, yes, it is. But that's not what you're doing. You're just hating it all the time. And there is a difference between those things. Um, do you think the the anti-Israel sentiment has just become a conduit for anti-Semitism, because it's it's an interesting issue, because I, 10 years ago or so, I probably would have said, look, we need to maintain a moral distinction between people who hate Israel and people who hate Jews. They are different things. But it's become clear to me over the past few years that they may well still be different in some ways, but the commonalities are becoming clearer and clearer. And anti-Zionism in particular seems to be a supposedly politically correct version of anti-Semitism. And I'm always struck by how all the things that were once said about the Jews are now said about Israel as a state, you know, that it is 
a bloodlusting state. It likes to kill children. Um, it's it controls world affairs through the Jewish state. All the stuff that they used to say about the Jewish people, the Jewish religion. So it has. It seems pretty clear to me that that's that seems to be the only purpose that the intense progressive hatred for Israel now plays. Do you think that's what's happened? Yes, I think you've just put it really well. I mean, you just have to look at. You know, it's so it's so extraordinary how tenacious that idea that oh, it's different. Like, we're, come on, we're allowed to criticize Israel just because I hate the government. Yeah, nobody's ever said you can't criticize Israel. Literally, Israel is founded in order to criticize itself. It, it's genuinely like this is the most mandate. This is such a straw man. Like, of course, you can criticize Israel. You can even be really like you can even boycott aspects of Israel, but you better also boycott all. So I think it's, you know, then they, then they ridicule you for what about And, you know, everything that people do is not a, when you try to do it w- with Israel, people are like, Oh God, you know, just because blah, 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 doesn't mean Israel, this and that. Um, so, but I think you just need, you know, so that's weird, but then you just look at like, okay, who are you siding with? You are siding with people that issue that like whose children in public displays in Gaza or wherever, literally have little pantos of machine gunning down Jewish children. I mean, th- whose cartoons are are about, you know, murdering, running after and murdering Jews and whose rhetoric is, is like, well, we know what the rhetoric is, not only from Palestine or the Palestinian territories, but Iran and, you know, numerous other Lebanon and North African countries. And, You just think, really? It's very telling that you're telling me that your passion for siding with that rhetoric and those people against the one people that live in a country with a Star of David as their flag, you know, you're telling me that's just like legitimate, like it just so happens I politically disagree. Um, It's it's just clearly about the Jews. And I mean... (laughs) These are just the, yeah, I mean, that that's what it is. But luckily, and this is how I always comfort myself, Israel does not need the world's good opinion. It, <laughs> it's it expected to never have it. It will never need it. It can defend itself. And well, I hope so anyway. Ever, so many Israelis leave now. I don't think it's the country it was originally. It's not even like I love Israel. I mean, I go to Israel and I'm like, oh God, this is actually kind of a shithole sometimes. Or, you know, or I'll be like, Israelis are annoying. Or, you know, I don't have a sort I used to be a bit more idealistic, but it's not that. And and at the moment, there's some politicians, you know, coming through and it all sounds pretty bad. But does that mean that, you know, Israel is sort of we don't first we don't know what's gonna happen now. But secondly, come on, are you, you know, you could, all this cleverness people indulge in to come up with little ways of delegitimizing Israel literally less than a hundred years after the Holocaust. Mm. It just blows my mind. And yet it's compl- not only respectable, it's like the backbone of the Guardian's entire foreign news outlook. I mean, the Guardian, oh God, yeah. Anyway. It is extraordinary. And one thing that has struck me over the past just over the past few weeks, is that there have been, there has been an extraordinary onslaught against the Kurdish people. Firstly, in Iran, where scores of Kurds have been massacred as part of the um, anti-regime protests. There's been a real attack on Kurds in Iranian Kurdistan. Turkey is upping the ante against the Kurds, as it often does, and has uh, dropped bombs in Syrian Kurdistan. Um And there's just not a peep. There's no protest. There's no marches in London, nothing whatsoever. And then there was footage of an Israeli soldier uh, manhandling a Palestinian girl and kind of being slightly rough with her and I think dragging her to the ground. And it went viral for days on end. And you just think to yourself, someone has got to explain this, right? Because if you don't explain it, then we are going to think you have a prejudice against this one state that happens to be the only Jewish state. There's so few convincing explanations as to why they focus on Israel more than any other country in the world, even countries that are doing far worse things. I just find it, it, it some, I've, I've never heard any explanation beyond the one that you've just given that makes sense to me. And the thing is, like, nobody will ever admit that, that you know, that's why Corbyn was constantly, you know, sur- seemed surprised when, like, another disgusting anti-Semitic outpouring emerged from from Momentum or whatever. But it wasn't, anyone watched, like, anyone with, who understood the, the the whole situation was not surprised. It was, it was built in. It was going to keep happening. It's a bit like a dog 
gets on the sofa and then jumps off the sofa and you get angry at the dog for having been on the sofa, but the dog doesn't know why it's not supposed to go on the sofa. Cause it's a dog, like it's going to jump back on the sofa. It doesn't understand why it's not. So it doesn't understand social niceties. It doesn't understand that it's dirty in the same way that the labor, of course, like they, they're the, the sort of fixation with Jews was so strong that of course they were going to keep doing it through, through the guise of, of Israel. But I think, you know, it's what's interesting perhaps about what, you know, what you're saying is not just that they can't explain it, but that the pe- there's a lot of people who are constantly giving very good explanations of the relationship between Zionism and a- Jews and anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. But everybody just, it's, nobody wants to hear it. it the Guardian is no, want, doesn't want to hear it. The, the left doesn't want to hear it. So, you know, I am someone who's constantly surrounded. I live in a culture in which anti-Israel is is in the air we breathe. But you know, and amazingly, I'm lucky. I have actually a surprising number of non-Jewish friends who who are who see that there's a problem and they are pro-Israel. And I I was am grateful to them for for that. But you know, mostly people don't want to hear mm. about this, and so the explanations are lost on them. So I I don't think there's all we can keep doing is just calmly. I suppose, and this is why I actually. I'm not that good. I, I I can write about this stuff, but I'm not very good at having verbal <laughs> conversations about it with people because I just lose my shit immediately. I mean, the amount of friends I've, I mean, it's, it's just not, I can't control myself. It makes me so angry. So, you know, there, luckily there are some cool headed, brave people around like you, Brendan, who can uh, fight the good fight for us. Okay. So speaking of the good fight, I have one more question for you before we end. This is a bit of a weird question given we've just talked about the very real problem of anti-Semitism in sections of the so-called progressive movement and some of the other things. But I wanted to ask you if you're feeling optimistic about 2023 in relation to lots of the things you write about. So you write about all sorts of things, but you are a very interesting critic of some of the excesses of wokeness or whatever the hell we're supposed to call it. You've taken to task um, aspects of the trans movement, And obviously you've talked about the problem of identity politics and there does seem to be a turn against some of that stuff. There does seem to be, people seem to be willing, ordinary people at least, to have a reckoning with wokeness or whatever we're supposed to call it. Do you feel optimistic that the pushback will continue in 2023 and that freedom and reason might start to poke their head above the parapet a little bit? Well, I have two sort of thoughts on that. One, it depends on whether on the wokeness front, it depends on whether people in the in institutions, in hospitals, in schools, and in universities, in police academies, in um, in all kinds of places that have been co-opted by it, actually start to stand up to this stuff and change diversity and inclusion policy, which I think is you know creates any number of sinister things, including you know what kids are taught at school. Here, I just want to also say that the, I'm a little worried about what's happening to the anti-woke side, yeah. so our side. I think it's gone a bit mad. I don't feel comfortable aligning myself with a lot of the people that I thought were fighting the good fight because I think they've gone a bit extreme on certain things. There's a lot of conspiratorial thinking, mm-hmm. um, not least around, I think, COVID and vaccines and things yeah. like that and hearing. I'm doing, and and but there also you know the right has a lot. There's a lot of anti-Semitism on the right as well. But there's just a lot of QAnon. There's a lot of incredibly mad people who aren't on the left, and so the left tend to not be as mad, but they're a bit more sinister. And the right, the the popular, and I you know I'm personally not really a populist. There's a lot of populism. There's conspiracy conspiracy theorizing. A lot of that seemed to emerge from the Trumpian moment in the way that you know Corbyn sort of gave us this hideous loony left moment. So I think I would like to see maybe a new cent- sort of move towards the sensible center <laughs> without giving up on being crystal clear about the problems of um of the of the kind of authoritarianism of of the woke positions who people that can both be let's say critical of if they want to be of lockdown let's say without leaping into mad f- rantings about science and mm-hmm. you know I I just I'd like to see more of that because I am scared would, am I, I mean, optimistic, you know what? Oh God. And then the invite, we didn't even talk about the green stuff. <laughs> Look, it's, we live in a news cycle that makes it very hard to be optimistic, but I would like to resort to my basic faith in humans um, and in human ingenuity, especially. And so I will say that, yes, I'm optimistic, even though there are 
we could still royally fuck it all up big time. Um, I mean, oh God, we could, we could appease Russia. We could have a nuclear, I mean, okay, I'm not massively optimistic, <laughs> but, but, but I, on the other hand, if the pushback, there are some, there are some signs of, of good stuff. Yeah, you're right. There are, there are. And, you know, the fact that, as you say, that Britain has this, you know, designation as Turf Island. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I interviewed Barry Weiss and um, she was saying how she could never say the stuff that our feminists can say, but now she can. And so clearly people are making inroads, but as I say, it's not enough for journalists and pundits to say the unsayable. We have to start seeing, you know, freaking Silicon Valley changing its policies. We have to see people really beginning to think diversity, these sacred cows, diversity and inclusion policy. These are so bad. I mean, they have to, yeah. And, and public publishers have gone, the arts. Let's see, let's see if any brave souls in 2023 push back against these things, brave editors at publishing houses, brave commissioners at theaters, which they're beginning to do, I think brave teachers, brave lecturers, brave doctors, and brave policemen and judges. And let's see. Zoe, thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan.